Hello again and welcome to another lecture on journalism and the law. Uh, I'm Professor Harper and today we're going to talk about the conflict really between free press, First Amendment, and fair trial, uh, which is basically covered by the Sixth Amendment. And so the Sixth Amendment basically says in all criminal prosecutions the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed, to be confronted with the witnesses against him, to have compulsory process for obtaining witnesses in his favor. And there's really no easy resolution between the ability of the media to cover and report about trials and the rights under the Sixth Amendment. So there, there's been a lot about prejudicial publicity in fair trials, which goes back basically for the last 50 plus years. In uh, Shepard v. Maxwell in 1966, the court provided options for a trial judge for prejudicial or disruptive press coverage of a criminal case. This was an incredibly important case um, which involved, uh, the, you know, which provided the basis for the fugitive. Um, and Sam Shepard was a prominent physician in Cleveland, Ohio and was charged uh, with killing his uh, his wife. So in this decision in 1966, um, essentially what the the Supreme Court decided was that there were that there were strict rules governing the use of the courtroom by reporters, that the number of reporters should be limited, and that there needed to be close regulation of the conduct of reporters in the courtroom. There was also a need to keep the witnesses away from the media and to control the release of information by attorneys, police, and other individuals. And <clears throat> reporters of prejudicial stories which happened in, uh, in Cleveland during the trial, which were really totally over the top, could have been warned. Uh, and one option that the judge could have had was to transfer the case to another venue so that um, so that there wouldn't have been the publicity, the influence of the of the press and the media on the outcome uh, of the trial. And also another option is the sequestration of the jury. You've seen this on Law and Order all the time, where where juries go to a, a motel or a hotel and they're they're not given the newspapers or allowed to watch news programs. And also, if publicity during the proceedings threatens the fairness of the trial, a new trial should should be ordered. So, even though the court specifically avoided considering what they called the sanctions that might be available against a recalcitrant press. The court also ruled that there is nothing that prescribes the press from reporting events that transpire in the, transpire in the courtroom. Um, the, d the decision was highly critical of the media's conduct during the proceedings, so that there was a lot of criticism in the decision. But the focus of the decision was to say, Mr. or Ms. Judge, you are supposed to be in control of the courtroom you should follow a whole series of guidelines in order to make sure that a defendant gets a fair trial. And so many judges actually read the decision as permission to take, you know, whatever steps were necessary. And they actually, they actually went over the top and there were other decisions that kind of dialed back the, uh, the power that the judges thought that they did in fact have. <clears throat> so, in terms of other judicial orders, Nebraska Press Association v. Stewart um, in, 196, in 1976 is an incredibly important decision which gave back a little bit more to the, uh, to the press in terms of coverage. So what happened after the Shepard decision was that there were judges really sought to control publicity that they thought that would be prejudicial. And journalists often refer to these as gag orders and, and <clears throat> essentially their, their purpose is to gag trial participants in the press in order to prevent information from being made public. And what happened in, um, and is, is that there were orders to prohibit participants from making comments about the case. There were, these are known as secrecy orders. And, you know, these are constitutional so that um, the judge will instruct the police, the investigators, the lawyers on the either side, the witnesses, 
and the various parties involved that they are not supposed to go to the press and if they do that they will be cited for civil contempt. Okay, so these are things that happened after the Shepard decision in 1966. <clears throat> Again, there was a third type of restrictive order that seeks, that sought to restrain the press by preventing publication. So this was prior restraint and generally are not constitutional. And this is this is what was found in Nebraska Press Association v. Stewart, is that the Supreme Court recognized that there was a need to protect a defendant's right to a free trial from prejudicial publicity, but it stated as an absolute rule that no restraints could be placed on reporting of a trial. The opinion in Nebraska Press Association outlined a three-part test to evaluate whether there could be a gag order against the press. Okay, So that if there was intense and pervasive pre-trial pre publicity that could reasonably be expected to impair the accused right to a fair trial, the judge could issue a gag order. Okay, But very specific and not saying that the press could not report whether other measures would be likely to mitigate the effects of unrestrained pretrial publicity was one way that the judge could consider it, and also to determine how effectively an order would operate to prevent the threatened danger, that the order must effectively keep prejudicial information from pr prospective jurors. Now, this was a test so that, so that the judge had to determine whether the right of a fair trial uh, would be uh, unavailable to a defendant. And if so, if it met these three parts of this test, then the judge could consider uh, a gag order and, and the Supreme Court would find it constitutional. Now, there have been issues uh, when it comes to clo closed courtrooms. Generally, it is not allowed to close a courtroom, although when it comes to immigration cases recently after 9-11, there has been one success successful attempt to close a courtroom when it comes to uh, a quote-unquote terrorist immigration issue. But, in 19, but for the most part, it's not possible to close courtrooms by the judge. So in 1980, <clears throat> um, in Richmond newspapers, versus Virginia, a county judge had cleared his courtroom of reporters and spectators before the fourth trial of a man who was charged with murder. His first trial had been invalidated on a technicality. The other two resulted in mistrials. Um, and the, the court said, and the, and the lawyers agreed, let's throw everybody out, figure this out, the judge, the lawyers, the defendant, uh, and the jury. But the Supreme Court said, no, you can't do that. And here is some more on that case, is that in a 7 to 1 decision, um, the Chief Justice Berger said whether the right of a public and a press to attend criminal trials has to be guaranteed under the U.S. Constitution. So for the first time, the court recognized a constitutional right for the public and the press to attend criminal trials. There are also issues when it comes to sealed documents, so that in 1983, um, <clears throat> an appellate court established a three-part test, so that there was substantial probability that damage to a defendant's fair trial right would result if the documents are not sealed. Okay, So it's a question of whether they should be sealed. A substantial probability that alternatives to closure will not adequately protect the right to fair trial, and a substantial probability that closure will be effective in protecting against the perceived harm. So the issue here is court documents are basically open to the public and the press. Now, is there going to be irreparable harm caused if specific documents are open to the press? 